Thank you for coming. Um, it's really nice to be here and um, come and talk a little bit about some of my work, some of my projects. Um, the, I guess what, what you'll soon sort of realize is that the work that I make is quite, I mean, formally it's incredibly diverse and um, I guess it has, I mean, there, there are certain kind of um, uh, themes running through the practice which I've been kind of working with um, over the last sort of 10 or 15 years. Um, and usually I try and kind of weave a, a different path through the work every time I make a talk. Um, I, um, um, I kind of like, I mean, in a way, Making, making talks is very much sort of, I really think of it a, a, as being very much part of the practice. Um, partly because the work, um, as you'll see, is kind of, it has a quite sort of anec anecdotal existence very often. And it, and it also involves performance to, to varying degrees. Um, I'm not a performer by any means, and I always kind of disappear from, from the work um, when it's uh, experienced by an audience, but um, there is that sort of dimension to it. And um, so for me, making, making talks about the work is a very kind of natural thing to do. Um, and um, so I'm really just going to, I'm going to start to um, sort of pick a, a path through various projects that I've been making. Um, the, the earliest of which is um, about five years old now. Um, and um, I'm not going to really talk about uh, the, the sort of thematics from the beginning, but I think it'll sort of slowly start to 
unfold as we go through. Um, if people have questions as we go along, then, then that's fine. But um, we'll also have some time at the end for questions. So um, uh, don't feel desperate. Um, one, of the, one of the sort of um, the things I've been sort of preoccupied with, I suppose, um, over the last few years has been a kind of interest in, in I mean, in a very general sense, in a sort of understanding of, of uh, what can l loosely be described as kind of globalization and, and looking at various kind of narratives that, um, that spring from that um, kind of understanding of the world. And um, one of the things I've been very interested in is, is the, the way plants, the way sort of nature um, moves around the world um, in um, sort of increasingly rapid um, ways. And um, I lived in Scotland for a long time in, um, in Glasgow and um, made a number of works related to this plant, which is um, it's a rhododendron uh, called Rhododendron ponticum. And um, it was uh, first brought to Britain by a, a Swedish botanist who was a, a student of Linnaeus. And um, he went to the south of Spain. He was actually studying the, the, the grazing patterns of sheep or something in Spain. But he found a little um, sort of colony of um, rhododendrons growing in the hills between Cadiz and Gibraltar. And he brought some of these back to, to Britain. And um, from there, um, this was in, um, in 1756, and from there they were um, introduced, first of all, into sort of ornamental gardens. And then, of course, they hopped over the wall of the garden and um, became a kind of, essentially, a huge problem, a weed, um, particularly in Scotland, um, where they seem to love the climate. And um, they're really a, a, a big problem now for kind of conservationists. And um, I was invited, um, yeah, some years ago now, to, to make a, uh, a public art project for this piece of land. It's a it's a, a, a piece of heathland, which is, as I'm sure you know, a very kind of sensitive and particular kind of configuration of, of plants and animals and. Um, it's also a, a, a sort of ecosystem which is uh, constantly sort of under threat. And one of the things that it's under threat from in Scotland is rhododendrons. Um, and I was, I, I, I was invited basically to make some kind of a sculpture or something to put on this piece of heathland, but I felt very uncomfortable about that. It's a very beautiful place and it's somewhere where people go and walk their dogs and, you know. And so I, I decided to... Um, I investigate a little bit the 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 sort of um, the sort of problems of of running the the, the heathland and maintaining it and and uh, one of the things that I came across was this kind of huge problem that they have with the rhododendrons and they were the guys who ran the the, the area were about to sort of cut down a lot of these plants um, and destroy them so I I sort of came up with the idea of rather than introducing something to the to the, the heathland to, to sort of remove something. So I, ma I made a proposal to return um, some of these rhododendron ponticum to, to the hills um, where they came from in the south of Spain. And um, I, I dug up seven of the plants and um, packed them into my Volvo estate and drove um, from the north of Scotland to the south of Spain. and. Um, sort of, I don't know, reintroduced them to their ancestors, I suppose, um, and planted them back um, in, in amongst the, the rhododendrons where they came from. Um, I kind of generated some art on the way. Um, and um, this photograph on the, on the right-hand side was made um, somewhere outside Bordeaux on the trip. And what I did was I, I just made a series of photographs um, uh, which, which sort of documented the plants and the car and um, et cetera, et cetera. And they, it was kind of configured in exactly the same way in each, in each location as I stopped on the, on the route to water the plants and, and give them some air and stuff. 
and then this became a, a very very simple um, sort of video piece which was a sort of a bit of a slide dissolve work in a sense so you move from the north of Scotland to the south of Spain in the company of these plants and eventually to um, the park Los Alcorno Cales where they, where they um, came from originally um, so it's a it's a kind of, in a way I put it at the beginning of the talk because it's a very sort of simple manifestation of, of, of my work a, a, in a way thinking about what it means to move something from one place to another um, from inside to outside or from one country to another and et cetera, et cetera um, or, or, or thinking about a kind of turning a narrative very simply upside down um, a kind of return if you like um, the, the, next, the next project, which is of course absolutely related to the, the first, um, is, is something that I made for the Venice Biennale. Um, it's a project called Island for Weeds, and um, it, it's, it's very much connected with the same story. This photograph on the left-hand side is um, the National Park of Scotland, which is... Um, a very new idea. It's, Scotland was never really sort of allowed a national park for some reason, or they never really knew how to, to deal with it. So about four or five years ago, um, they um, started a national park, which was just about sort of defining a, an area of kind of um, of, uh, of land. And it's just outside Glasgow, um, and it's it's based around this large lake called Loch, Lo Lo Loch Lomond. And um, it's a very, very beautiful place. But one of the things, of course, that the, when you start trying to define, as national parks do, when they, you start trying to define, in a way, your cultural identity through, through your, your sort of natural um, uh, environment, things like rhododendrons become kind of problematic because nobody really knows how to deal with them. They're, on the one hand, they're on every single sort of picturesque calendar of Scotland that exists. Um, and on the other hand, they're a huge problem, a pest, they're sort of a non-indigenous plant. And um, so I thought it would be really interesting to try and sort of work with this sort of problem um, within the, the national park. So I came up with this idea, working with a, a marine engineer to make a, a sort of floating um, island to um, sort of sustain and contain a group of, of, of plants. And um, this project went on for two years or so. And um, eventually it, it became a kind of sort of, I don't know, rather controversial in a way. Because one of the funders for the, the national park is um, Scottish National Heritage. And they were putting money into making these public works. But they also give about five million pounds a year to farmers and landowners to destroy these rhododendrons. So they, they kind of, they, they feared some kind of crazy media backlash against them saying, on the one hand, you're protecting these plants and then you're spending five million pounds um, destroying them. You know, isn't there a contradiction there? And they, they basically, they got cold feet about the whole thing and they backed off from the project. And um, so, <sighs> in a way as a kind of revenge um, to sort of throw it back in their faces a bit. When I was invited to, um, to Venice for the Biennale, um, I decided to sort of present the work um, a little bit out of, out of context. Um, and um, we built a, a rather smaller but, but sort of working model of the island, um, and it was shown in this fantastic palazzo overlooking the Grand Canal. Um, and it was a sort of, of course, in this kind of floating city, it seemed to sort of make sense. And it also had a very nice relationship to these rather sort of um, over the top camp uh, paintings um, that sort of line the walls of the, of the, um, of the palazzo. And it was almost as if it was kind of tugging on its chains to try and get into the, the Grand Canal and escape to freedom somehow. And it, it also had a lovely relationship to this extremely ornate Murano glass chandelier. It was almost like an upside down version of that somehow. 
down the other side of the space, down the other end of the space. So that was Island for Weeds. And I guess I made that, I don't know, four years ago now or something. Three years ago, I don't know, yeah. And these are the two anchors which would have sort of tethered it to the bottom of uh, Loch Lomond had it ever floated. We're still trying to find a home for it on the water. So if anybody has a big pond that they want a little island for, I'm up for offers. Um, the, next, the next project that I'm going to talk about um, sort of comes, and in fact, comes quite, in a way, very directly from the work I did with the rhododendrons in Spain. When I was kind of researching the, the sort of history of these plants, um, a friend of mine said, oh, you have to go, go, to, um, go to the Tabernas Desert when you go and, and have a look at the, um, the cactuses there. Um, the Tabernas Desert is the, the only um, sort of true desert in, in Europe. It's a very small area. Um, and it's growing all the time. It's, it's um, like much of the south of Spain, it's getting drier and drier and hotter and hotter. And um, the European um, uh, community a few years ago sort of pumped lots of money in to try and sort of deal with this problem. Um, and it's a really, it's a, for me, it's a really interesting kind of area um, for many reasons. Um, it sort of has this sense of being I don't know, like a vision of the future or something. Um, it's somewhere you can imagine, you know, J.G. Ballard or somebody writing a, a book. Um, it, ha it, has, um, it has these huge areas of, of um, what's called plasticulture, which is basically farming um, under sort of plastic tents, um, which happens all year round to grow vegetables, flowers, and things for the north of Europe. Um, it's a huge employer. Um, they're digging, they're, they're pumping water from deeper and deeper underground to sort of sustain this um, agriculture. They don't actually know how long the water's going to sort of last. So it's a strange, it's a strange sort of, um, a strange phenomena. There's also this rather beautiful um, solar research center. Um, which again was set up with, with European money to try and, one of the main roles of the place is to try and use solar power to turn seawater into fresh water and use it for irrigating the desert and for farming and all these other kinds of things. Um, so there's this sort of strange collision of very high tech and very low tech um, kind of practices. And then of course there's, um, Sergio Leone, who um, filmed a lot of his spaghetti westerns in, in the Tabernas Desert um, in the 1960s and 70s. And um, they've made a bit of a kind of culture industry out of the, the remains of that practice. And they're actually still making films there. When I was there, they were shooting a, a French western. I wasn't quite sure what that was. but um, And um, it's kind of funny to see. It was, it was basically, it, in a way, it's a sort of a piece of globalization in itself, this idea of trying to find somewhere sort of cheaper to make films that look like they're shot in Texas or Arizona or something. And, and Leone's solution was, was the Tabernas Desert. Um, and you can still go and see all these um, film sets. But what, what I was interested in was the, the, the planting that was, had been going on over, over the years um, in and around the film sets. Um, a lot of kind of introduced um, species of, of cacti, which kind of basically served as props for the filming of, 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 of the films. Um, and uh, there are various kind of, the most common is this um, Playa Puntia cactus, of course, the sort of prickly pear, but there's all sorts around. And they've been, they've been planted over the years. Um, they're not all original Leone cactuses, I'm afraid to say. But um, yeah, and um, I, I, was, uh, I was invited to, to make an exhibition at, um, at Porticus, which is a, a gallery space in, um, in, uh, in Frankfurt, um, where I teach as well. And, um, 
I, I decided to make a sort of a project around around one of these cactuses from from the film sets. And so I went I went to Spain. I drove again. I took my my re, my trusty red Volvo with me, and I drove south um, to the Tabernas Desert. And I managed managed to persuade the people who um, run the uh, the film sets now to let me dig up one of their cactuses. I had to sort of pay them a rather hefty backhander, um, and uh, and uh, so I so I dug up uh, what, something called a Cereus cactus, and I stuck it in the car and I drove back to to Frankfurt with it to a kind of rather wintry uh, Frankfurt, and I made a I made a project in the gallery called Cactain House, which means cactus house in in uh, in German. And it's a kind of, um, it's a sort of collision of a fantastically efficient um, survivor, the cactus, and this incredibly inefficient organism that man invented um, at the end of the 19th century, um, the internal combustion engine. And um, one object kind of sustains the other in a rather sort of perverse way. What I did was I removed the, the the engine from my car and installed it as a heating system for the the space so to create create a, a kind of nice climate in in cold old frankfurt for the cactus and um the the car was um reconnected to the engine with sort of 30 meters of piping and electrical cables and all the other things that you need to make uh, an engine run and um, each morning, the the gallery assistant would would um, open up the the Volvo, sit in the in the in the driver's seat, and turn on the um, ignition, and the car came on in the exhibition space. And um, you could kind of control the heat of the space by pulling the choke in and out. Um, so the the sort of idling speed of the car um, engine sort of controlled the 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 space in the the heat in the space. And then, of course, the, the petrol was still in the petrol tank, and the exhaust came out of the exhaust, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. It's an ugly big thing, a Volvo engine, I tell you. <coughs> Excuse me. And we had a little thermometer on the wall, just sort of monitoring um, the temperature of the room. So it's a sort of diagram of how an internal combustion engine works in a way. The other, the other project um, that, that kind of came out of um, my trips to the Tabernas Desert was um, something called the Tabernas Desert Run, which um, I realized about 18 months ago. Um, and um, it's, of course, based on a, a project that um, Chris Burden made in, in Death Valley in, in 1976 called the Death Valley Run, which was, <coughs> he built a, um, a very small, um, a, a sort of moped using a very small Japanese engine. Um, and he made the sort of most efficient crossing of Death Valley that he, he could um, with this um, this very sort of ergonomic um, moped, <coughs> I think it took him seven hours or something to go the the the, the distance, um, and he carried some fuel on the back of the, the bike to to refill the the fuel tank, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, I thought it was kind of a nice a nice idea to to sort of, in a way, re recreate this 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 trip, but in this kind of Ersatz Wild West in um, in the south of Spain, and so I built a, a kind of contemporary, I don't know, descendant, if you like, of, of Burden's little moped um, using a, a fuel cell, um, <coughs> which is, of course has a sort of slightly perverse relationship to a desert because the only waste product that it produces is water, and um, I made a a crossing of um, the Tabernas Desert, which is 
a mere 42 miles or something on my fuel cell powered um, moped. The fuel, cell, the fuel cell was actually invented um, really early in, in the 1830s by a British um, chemist called William Grove. Um, but sort of following the, the rise and rise of the, um, um, the sort of petroleum age, um, it, it sort of died away for a long time and, and was sort of um, rediscovered much, much later as a, as a sort of feasible alternative to the internal combustion engine or whatever. And um, this is a, a, a sort of commercially available fuel cell made by a company in Canada called, called Ballard, which is basically a sort of, yeah, a generator for electricity. And I got these, these very lightweight um, um, gas bottles to, to, to sort of carry the hydrogen. And o over the 42 miles, I, I managed to collect um, about 600 milliliters of, of um, water. Um, a lot of the water actually sort of evaporates and, and you lose it, but I, I collected quite a lot of it. It's actually made, the, the moped's made from two um, rally racing bikes kind of welded together because the fuel cell's so big it wouldn't fit in a normal um, bicycle frame. And I sort of made some improvised snaps en route. Um, I tend to do these things um, alone, so it's always a bit of a problem sort of documenting things, but um, yeah, somehow it's nice to do. And then I, I kind of, I, I made the piece that, that was presented in the exhibition in the end was, was a sort of, um, uh, I, I, I collect, as I said, I collected 600 milliliters of water, which I then used to make this kind of rather crude, um, almost naive kind of watercolor of one of the cactuses that I, I passed en route um, across the desert, one of the um, Pleopuntia cactuses. Um, so that was sort of contained in this, in this sealed vitrine, this perspex vitrine, um, and um, yeah. I suppose as a little kind of, I don't know, sort of nod to Hans Hacker's condensation cube or something. I thought it'd be nice to sort of contain the whole, the whole little sort of ecosystem of the project in this Perspex box. The, I don't actually kind of, in a way I don't sort of feel so, I don't know why I decided to do this. I don't usually talk about projects that I'm still working on because I, I always think it's probably bad luck or something. But um, I, um, I'm in, in the process of, of making a, a project in, in Toronto for the power plant um, for an exhibition I'm making there later in the year. And um, which is also related to sort of, um, non-indigenous species to kind of infestations, if you like. And um, it's, it's um, again, it's a sort of, um, in a way, like the Tabernas Desert Run sort of is directly sort of appropriated from, from the Chris Burden piece. Um, I'm, I'm using a, a work by Henry Moore. Um, Henry Moore has a very sort of close relationship to to Toronto, he, he, was, he was commissioned to make various large public sculptures there. And he was very, he was very impressed by the, the sort of local government and the way they managed to raise quite a lot of money to make all these projects possible. And so he, at the end of his life, he, he left a num quite a large number of his, his works to the AGO, the Art Gallery of on Ontario. And, um, Henry Moore had a bit of a sort of penchant for picking up stones on beaches. And um, he used to find these little pieces of flint and then use them as sort of the starting point for, for sort of large figurative sculptures. 
and um, it this kind of this idea um, somehow in my mind collided with this um, problem that they have in in the Great Lakes in general, um, but particularly in Lake Ontario with with zebra mussels, which were introduced by accident um, into the lake in the kind of bilge water from trading ships. Um, and um, they come originally from around the, uh, the Baltic. Um, and uh, no, from the Black Sea, I beg your pardon. And um, so they, they've radically altered the, the sort of ecosystem of the lake. And nobody really knows how, what's going to happen now. But um, there is this rumor that they're starting to sort of die off. Because basically what they do is they clean everything out of the water, all the kind of anything you can eat, they'll, they'll eat it. Um, so they sort of filter water. They're actually used in, in, in lakes very often to, to clean sort of pollution and things. So um, there is this rumor that they're starting to sort of defeat themselves almost. So, um, yeah, I decided to sort of make a, a, a kind of a work that's a sort of collision between the sort of Henry Moore story and the, and the story of the, the zebra mussels. And, um, yeah, this is the, one of the major works that, that Henry Moore made in, in Toronto. It's in a, a major sort of public square. It's called the Archer. And then this is the AGO where the... Um, the work that I'm sort of co-opting uh, comes from. When, of course, when, when I started to sort of think about making the, a project with the, the muscles, of course, this man, um, Marcel Brutiers, came, came to mind. Um, uh, and it sort of has a nice relation to, to he, he of course was using the, the muscle as this kind of symbol of, of, um, of Belgium and um, made various pieces um, sort of encrusting muscle shells onto to, to surface it. The piece, the, the postcard on, on the right hand side is, is called um, Panneau de Moule. Um, and it's a it's a, a wooden panel covered in these like a kind of abstract painting almost covered in these these muscles, um, and um, what 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 I'm actually doing for the project is is this this is a, a piece Henry Moore made between 1954 and 1955, and it's called um, Warrior Warrior with a Shield. Um, it's a, a bronze piece um, about, I don't know, five, five or six feet high. Um, and um, it's one of the works in the, the AGO collection. And um, after an extremely long process of sort of negotiation with the AGO and with the Henry Moore Foundation in Britain, um, we are in the process of making a um, a replica of um, the sculpture, which fairly shortly will be thrown into Lake Ontario, um, and will sit about 10 meters um, down, um, and hopefully will become kind of home to quite a lot of um, zebra mussels. But it's one of these things. I don't know. It's like never work with small children or mollusks i don't know it's sort of it's a little bit scary because we're going to we're going to sort of fish this thing out of the the lake um probably a few weeks before the exhibition begins and uh maybe there's not going to be anything on it i don't know so um yeah it's a kind of yeah an infestation piece somehow Um, the the next the next work um, that that I'm going to talk about is is something that I made um, in Turin um, a few years ago. Um, it's a piece that I showed I showed it at the, the Venice Biennale also the same year that the the Island for Weeds was shown. So some of you may have seen it there. I don't know. Um, 
again, it's a, a project that, that sort of came out of its, uh, out of its sort of, out of its context very much and um, about, came out of sort of stories um, that um, sort of connect with, with sort of a global understanding of the world, a global market in this case. And um, it's, a, it's a project called um, Flagger. This is the, the, the famous Lingotto factory um, in the heart of um, Turin. This is the, the, the test track where they used to drive every car that came out of the, um, the factory would drive up onto the roof up this ramp and have a spin around the, the test track just to sort of make sure it was all hunky-dory before they sold it to somebody. Um, and um, the, um, the car on the, the car on the right hand side is a, a 1974 um, Fiat 126, which was one of the last of the Fiat 126s to be, to be produced in, in Turin. Um, Fiat kind of quite early on discovered that it was much, much cheaper to build cars in Poland. Um, and so they set up a big um, uh, plant um, in, the south of, in the south of Poland and the whole of the production of the 126 moved to, um, to Poland. And um, they kept making pretty much exactly the same car for 20 years in Poland, which is quite a strange, it could, could only have happened under this kind of um, communist regime. Um, and the, the, one, the Fiat 126, a little bit in the same way that the, the Fiat 500 was really the kind of the Italian people's car um, in, in the 1950s and 60s, the, the, the Fiat 126 became the Polish people's car. And so I, I decided to make a project um, using this little red car. We, we managed to sort of track one down. It's very hard to find them now, which, which have the, the kind of marking from the, the Turin factory. And we, we eventually sort of in the middle of nowhere found an old lady who sort of drove her car about twice a year, as far as we could make out, who, who turned up with this immaculate um, 1974 Fiat in her sort of Sunday best and there was a tear in her eye when we drove away in her car but she was sort of happy to see it go as well I think and I drove the car from from Turin to to Poland and in Poland I um, I found a, a mechanic to work with and um, we made a kind of a, a, an exchange a transformation of the car and um, all of the the, the sort of movable body parts of the 1974 Italian car were, were replaced with um, white Polish produced body parts um, which were manufactured um, in 2000 and they still f would fit on the, the 1974 car which is quite extraordinary. Um, these, are, these are a few of the, the sort of cars that I discovered when I arrived in, in Poland. There's a sort of whole culture of um, sort of using and abusing these, these cars and, and a lot of them get sort of souped up and big engines stuck in them and um, spoilers and things like that. Um, and some of them just get kind of forgotten and, um, but they're everywhere. Families of five would go on holiday in these things um, in the summer. It's quite extraordinary. So this is the the altered car, um, and um, I basically, I once the once the work had been done at the garage, I, I drove the car back to um, back to Turin, and um, <coughs> worked with um, some engineers there to install it in the in the gallery. Franco Nuero, the the gallerist, he had a very very small space at the time, and the car would just about sort of fit in the door. And um, we, yeah, we installed the, the car um, pretty much like a, a painting, I suppose, um, in, in, the, in the gallery. Um, it's, 
yeah, it's just sort of hung on the wall. Um, it was very nice watching people drive past looking for a parking space. That was really, that was really good fun. So the, the car was there, and then in the back space there was a, um, a text on the wall which just described very, very simply the, the, the journey that had been made and the, and the exchange of, of, of body parts. Um, all, of the, all of the Polish Fiats have this P for Poland after the 126, which is how you can tell very often where they were manufactured. They actually made, in, in 2000, when they, when they stopped manufacturing the, the car, they made a special edition called the Happy End. Um, and uh, yeah, you see them around. This is the, the little text um, on the wall. It just says a Fiat 126 produced in Turin, Italy in 1974, customized using parts um, produced and manufactured in Poland um, following a journey of 1,260-something kilometers from Turin to Czecin. So that's flagger. Flagger is the Pol Polish word for a flag, of course. And the, the car sort of sits somewhere between being a, an Italian flag and a Polish flag somehow. We also made a book. I often, I often make um, books for, for the projects. And um, they, they've sort of, again, because of, for the same reason I like sort of doing talks, the, the books are quite, are, are quite key very often. And, and we managed to track down one of the original car manuals from, from the, the Fiat from the 70s. And I worked with this wonderful graphic designer in, in, in Berlin called Philip Arnold, and we um, put together this um, sort of almost facsimile of the, the original book. Um, we actually had to sort of des re redesign typefaces and all sorts of things to get it to um, to get it to work. And it had this rather deluxe kind of fold-out page with a a plan of the gallery and the position of the car on the wall. We did actually remove the engine from the car because it was rather heavy for the. Um, <coughs> Um, in a way, I suppose, sort of continuing this sort of idea of redeploying um, existing artworks and objects, um, I thought I'd talk briefly about a project I made in, in New York um, two years ago, um, which was shown at the uh, Casey Kaplan Gallery. Um, and it, it sort of involves various kind of, well, it sort of conflates various sort of stories. And one of the stories is um, the story of how um, Marcel Duchamp, I'm sure it's a story that all of you know, it's very, very sort of um, well known now. Um, Marcel Duchamp was sort of acting as a, as a sort of dealer in a way for, for Brancusi, who, who was living in Paris. And, and Duchamp was making regular trips across the Atlantic to, um, to work and also to, to um, bring Brancusi's work across to, to sell to collectors and things. And um, on one of these trips, um, Duchamp um, brought the, the Bird in Space sculpture. It's a, a piece he made in 1924. Um, and it was to be sold to Edward Steichen, um, the, the photographer. Um, and when they arrived, when Duchamp arrived in, in, in New York, um, he went through customs with, with the work. And the customs refused to accept the fact that what um, Duchamp was presenting them with was, was a, an artwork. They'd never seen anything quite like this before. Um, and at the time, um, the, um, there was a, a rather stiff import duty on, on metal objects coming into, to, um, into America, whereas with artworks there was no tax, there was no import duty at all. So basically the, the US Customs said, no, this isn't an artwork, it's a piece of metal, and they charged Duchamp 40% tax. Um, 
tax to import the piece, which of course Edward Steiking, as the buyer of the piece, had to pay. So in the end, um, Brancusi took the US customs to court to sort of fight this decision. And there's this kind of amazingly bizarre transcript of the court case, which is available as a, as a book now. Um, and in the end, the, the Brancusi won the court case, and they, they redefined the um, definition of an artwork within, within the American legal system. Um, it's sort of, it, I just threw this other image in, of course, the, the bicycle wheel, because they, they sort of, in a way, they, there's this sort of anecdote that the, the, two, the two pieces come from the same source. There was a, a story about Duchamp and, and um, Brancusi going to this um, air show in Paris um, in 1911, I think it was and just before uh, Duchamp made the bicycle wheel and they sort of were recorded as having sort of marveled at these beautiful um, metal propellers, aeroplane propellers and of course since then there's been this sort of suggestion that um, uh, Brancusi sort of got the idea for his um, sort of anamorphic bird sculpture um, from, from this trip and, and also uh, Duchamp perhaps his kind of mobile The, the, other two, the other two characters involved in this, this work, um, Mr. Bush on the left and Mr. Blair on the right. Um, Mr. Blair is involved in a slight, slightly oblique way because he, there was a big scandal a few years ago in, in Britain because um, Tony Blair had written a rather nice letter on behalf of this steel tycoon called Lakshmi Mittel um, who um, wanted to buy the Romanian steel industry, um, which was kind of falling apart. And he has a reputation for sort of turning these things around. And Mr. Bush, um, in return for a rather large donation to the Labour Party, um, gave um, his sort of backing to, to Mr. Mattel, to the, to the Romanian government. And Mr. Mattel subsequently bought the Romanian nationalized steel industry. And um, around about the same time, Mr. Bush introduced a 40% tax on um, steel coming into America um, to sort of, of course, protect um, the steel industry in, in, um, uh, in the States and probably win a few votes and various other things as well. Um, so I sort of, yeah, I decided to sort of, yeah, collapse these, these sort of two tales, one on top of the, the story of the bird in space and the, and the, the sort of contemporary story of um, the, uh, the steel tax. And um, I decided to import uh, a piece of steel into the States as an artwork rather than as a piece of steel. Um, <laughs> to try and avoid the 40% the tax on the, on, the, um, on the piece. So we didn't really know what, what was going to arrive. I mean, I sort of ordered something of a particular size. And this incredibly rusty but rather beautiful slab of two and a half tons of Romanian steel turned up at the gallery one day um, with this very beautiful Romanian sticker on it, or rather sort of sprayed logo for the um, Sidex um, steel plant, which is one of the plants now owned by Mr. Mittel. Um, and the, the, the piece of steel was, was very, very simply um, installed in the gallery. Um, it was kind of floated in a way uh, as a sort of nod back to Brancusi, I suppose. Um, we, we floated this two and a half ton slab of steel on these inflatable jacks, which are extraordinary things. They're just these kind of rubber pillows. Uh, and if you put some helium gas, some inert gas into them, they can lift, I don't know, seven and a half tons or something, each of them. Um, so the, 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 the sort of really heavy piece of Romanian steel was kind of floated 
in the gallery in New York um, for the exhibition. I also made a, a photo work which was sort of also shown at the same time, which sort of came out of another project. I mean, I, it, I won't go into the, the details, but of course, it's a, I, I tried to make a, a sort of a five-man bicycle once, and uh, I just used standard wheels to start with, and it just didn't work. And this is what was sort of generated from that. So I made this, I made this photograph um, as a result of that, which is sort of somewhere between Duchamp's bicycle wheel and Brancusi's sort of amorphic somehow. Um, <clears throat> and then so sort of, I suppose, connected to that, to this sort of international trade stories. Um, when I, I, was, I was invited a couple of years ago to think about making a, an exhibition in Switzerland in, in the Museum for Gegenwartskunst in, in Basel. And um, I'd, been, uh, I'd been reading about this fantastic um, money-making scheme that the Swiss came up with, <coughs> which involves, at, at night time, the, uh, the Swiss buy cheap electricity from their neighbors when they don't need it. And they use the electricity to pump water into holding reservoirs. And um, then during the day when Italy and Germany and France are desperate for energy, they use the, 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 the reserves of water to generate hydroelectric power, which they then sell back to their neighbors for much, for much more money than they paid for it. It's a kind of beautiful, beautiful model somehow. And this, this sort of became, I don't know, it became the sort of the starting point for, for sort of, I suppose it, it's, it's anyway somehow connected to a lot of the projects I've made, but it, it, it sort of became the sort of the starting point for thinking about the exhibition. And um, I, uh, I made various works that sort of had a very close relationship to, to the river in Basel, which is, which is a very sort of, the Rhine runs through the middle of Basel, and it's a very sort of powerful sort of force um, in the city. Um, there's lots of kind of nice stories about, like the, 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 Kunst, the, Kunst, um, the Kunsthalle in Basel is actually m built with money generated from one of the yawling ferries that run across the the river, the, the, the association that started the Kunsthalle, they, um, they managed to get a license to run one of these ferries, <coughs> which is only driven by the, the current of the stream. And you're sort of on a, a, a steel cable, and you run back and forwards across the river. And um, I'm just going to drink some water so I don't choke to death. So they ran, the, the Kunstverein um, ran this ferry for 25 years and all of the money from running the ferry they put into this pot and into the bank and they used that money to build this very beautiful exhibition space. Um, so somehow, I don't know, the, the river, it's, it's just an example of, one example of how the river is so sort of tied up with the way that the, the city is, is um, sort of structured. And this is, I, I don't know, I'm not going to talk so much about this work. I mean, in a way, there's not so much to say, I suppose. But it was, <coughs> I had, from the very beginning, I had an idea to, they were just restoring the, uh, my show was the first show at the, at the Gegenwarts Museum after it had been restored. <coughs> and this sort of led me to think it would be nice to do something rather sort of destructive to it. Um, so. I came up with this idea to make a very, very simple exchange of two parts of the building. And the original plan was to take a two meter diameter section of the concrete and plaster wall from the top floor of the museum and exchange it with the same size piece from the bottom floor of the museum on a revolving metal arm. So you'd end up pretty much with what you started with, but the bottom would be the top and the top would be the bottom, of course. And Again, a bit like my island for weeds, that, that was a sort of ongoing project for a long time. And I was working with engineers, and everything seemed to be going fine. And then at the 11th hour, they, they sort of pulled the people who owned the building, not the people that run the museum, but the people who owned the building that the museum is housed in, 
pulled the plug on it. And I think it was because they actually were really scared that the building had been very badly built. And they thought that if I started cutting holes in the wall that it might start to fall apart. So um, instead of that, I, I was still very keen that this very simple kind of, in a way, model um, for the exhibition um, would, would somehow have a presence there. So I made, I made these sort of much smaller, very simple um, versions just using the 12 centimeter thick plasterboard wall that, ha that lines the, the museum. So I made this much lighter, much simpler kind of work. So we just exchanged, um, on, on the ground floor there was a sort of horizontal exchange and on the top floor there was a, um, a vertical um, exchange from, from top to bottom. So these these were there were lots of there was lots of screw holes from from sort of attaching the metal plate to the wall to sort of stabilize everything. So they became very much like little drawings in in the space, al almost invisible at times. Um, and then we just left the the hole as the the, cen the central sort of access for the the the, the piece. <clears throat> This is, these are, I'm sure many of you will know these photographs. They're by a very wonderful artist called Christopher Williams who, who works in LA. Um, and um, I've always been a bit of a fan. And um, I, I sort of start, started to think about these photographs again because they're, they're photographs of, he made seven photographs of this dam. Um, called the Grand Dissence, um, which was, when it was built in the 1950s, was the, the biggest dam of its kind in the world. And um, it was made, the photographs, Williams's photographs are kind of, in a way, made as a, as a sort of tribute to, to Jean-Luc Godard, who's, who's um, Williams is a, a, a big fan of Godard. And um, Godard made his first ever film, um, believe it or not, at this dam when it was being when it was being built, um, I think that I think the story goes that actually Godard was working as a as a laborer kind of um, while he was studying or something uh, on on the building of the dam, and somebody found out that he was kind of making film, and they asked him to make this short documentary about the the building of the dam. I might be wrong about that, but I think that's how it worked, and he made this this film called um, Operation Beton, Operation Concrete, which is a sort of very sort of romanticized um, sort of eulogy or something to, to concrete and its potential. And so Williams made this sort of pilgrimage to, to the dam and, and made these seven photographs. Um, and so I, I, I started to sort of think about trying to sort of continue that, that process. Um, that sort of <coughs> um, sort of referential process, if you like, and I went. I went to. I discovered. I tried to find out where these photographs were in the world, and I went to all of the collections in in Europe where these seven photographs exist. And um, I. Um, these are a couple more of them. Um, And I made I made I made photographs of of interestingly enough the the photographs were all when I when I found them in the museum they were all in storage um, and generally on these kind of big sort of sliding racks that, that museums use for storing photographs and prints and things and so I made a series of 21 images of the three sets the three editions of these photographs that exist in in Munich and Berlin and and uh, Rotterdam, <coughs> and then I sort of returned them in a way to to Switzerland. Um, these are just the 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 work has this kind of extra sort of layer or dimension, if you like, which is which is through the sort of physical, in a way, physical transformation of of, of Williams's images. His images are a kind of traditional silver prints, and I decided to sort of play with the almost the sort of the stuff of the photographs and I made a series my, my 21 photographs were made with this very traditional 
um, platinum printing process. And one of the, one of the parts of, of, of making this and a few other projects was to make this trip to the, the mine, um, which is, um, this is a, a platinum mine in, in South Africa, in Pot Geitres. Um, it's a huge, huge hole in the ground, as you can see. And I was, I was really fascinated by one of, one of the reasons platinum is, is so expensive is that it, it requires huge amounts of energy to, to extract and is very sort of disparate in the rock. And um, you need 20 tons of ore from this mine to make one ounce of, of platinum. So there's this incredible sort of, um, yeah, it's a sort of phenomena in a way. And um, so I, I started to sort of think about this in relation to Williams's pictures of this mine, this huge kind of engineering project um, in Switzerland. And again, kind of forced these things together um, in a way in the work and produced these um, 20, I'm sorry, I don't, I, I don't have any details of, of the photographs, but you can probably just about see what's going on. They're, they're, they're just very simple sort of documents of Williams's 21 photographs, some made very close up, some made of the, the whole storage where the, the photographs were, were made. Um, yeah. And it, the, the piece has a, has a very long title, which is basically the story I told you at the beginning of explaining this work about how the Swiss buy cheap electricity from their neighbors at night and then use it to pump water into holding reservoirs and then during the day use it to generate electricity which they then sell back to their neighbors. So it's, it's a kind of, yeah, there's lots of kind of ideas, I suppose, packed into the one, the one piece. But somehow it has a very simple, a very simple manifestation at the end. Um, I'm just going to talk about one more project which was also made for the same exhibition in, in Basel which is the, of course, this kind of decrepit shed that you can see just around the corner from the photographs. <coughs> um, I, I, I kind of, it's, I've always, I've always been an extremely lucky artist somehow. Um, I kind of, I often have these very sort of um, strong, ideas in my head about a work that I want to make. And, um, but it sort of always requires finding things. And um, for example, I, I, once, I once made a work for a show in Australia and I needed a balsa tree. Um, and I sort of knew that balsa trees came from Ecuador, um, but not much more than that. And so I wrote a fax to the the British consul in, in Guayaquil, in Ecuador, sort of saying, um, blah, 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 I'm doing this project, I'm an artist, and I wonder if you can point me in the right direction. And then about two hours later, I got the same fax back with a sort of scribbled note on the bottom. And it said, uh, yep, no problem. Uh, I have a banana plantation. One of my balsa trees got struck by lightning three months ago. It's yours. I'll pick you up from the airport. So I went, I went to, uh, I went to Ecuador, and this guy arrived in a big Range Rover and with his diplomatic plates and drove me around, and took me to his banana plantation. And sure enough, there was a big balsa tree, and I could take as much as I wanted. So these things kind of—it's this sort of strange serendipity somehow that that when you go looking for something, you you tend to find it. And this this project is absolutely a kind of case in point, I suppose. Um, I kind of had this, it was a slightly half-baked idea, um, again connected to the river in Basel, um, that I wanted to make a sort of piece of mobile architecture, or a, a sort of mobile architecture system, if you like. And um, I, I, I borrowed the, the curator's bicycle, and I went on a, a ride up the river past all these kind of chemical plants, um, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I was getting a bit, you know, I was like 10 kilometers outside town. I was getting a bit sort of depressed or I don't know, I'm never going to find anything. And then I sort of came out 
into this clearing and there was this shed, um, this old wooden shed with a paddle on the side and uh, it was just like a kind of a gift somehow and um, the whole project suddenly like in 20 seconds kind of fell into place. Um, the paddle on the shed is, is from a, a, a traditional boat that they, they still sail on the um, on the Rhine called, uh, or paddle on the Rhine I should say, called a Weidling and it's, um, it used to be used for, for kind of trade and, and sort of moving stuff about but now it's just mostly a kind of um, a sport, they, they sort of race these boats and it's a bit like a gondola, you stand up in the back of the boat and you, you push on this, this long paddle and then on the way up the river you use a, a pole very close to the bank where the water is not moving so fast and, and move that way. Um, and so there was this shed, this, this wooden structure with a paddle on the side and, and as I say the rest is kind of yeah, history. It, the, the other piece of luck was that the people who owned the shed were desperate to get rid of it. it they, they'd been sort of thinking about how to deal with it, what they should do with it, should we just burn it, whatever. And we, we sort of phoned from the museum and they were said, yeah, of course you can have it. And, and they gave us a big space to work in as well. So what, what I did was, um, as you probably guessed by now, is um, built a vidling from the shed, from the wood from the shed, um, with the help of two very nice artists, Johannes and Heimo. Um, it took, yeah, about three weeks or so to build. Um, the shed was, every, every part of the shed was numbered um, and then the shed was kind of taken apart and um, we sort of started to look for the best pieces of timber um, for building this boat. It was actually, we discovered it's the first wooden vidling to have been built in, in Basel for, for many, many years and the, the people who owned the, the vidling club nearby were extremely excited and um, kind of, um, yeah, got very involved. The, I suppose that, in a way, the, the, the idea for the, the, the project comes from this kind of age-old relationship between architecture and, and boat building. Um, the, you know, the Vikings, for example, when they turned up in Denmark in, in, in the winter would turn up turn their long boats upside down to make these very simple sort of shelters to keep the, the cold weather out. And um, the, the sort of, it, it's, it's, there's always been this sort of, this link between, between architecture and, and um, boat building. The, the, the word for the nave of a church comes from the same source as naval or navigation. Um, because essentially it's a, a boat upside down and there's the root, the word, for, I think the word in Japanese for a, 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 a ceiling is the same as the floor of a boat or something, that, I don't know if that's true but that's what I read somewhere. There's a very nice text by, by Buckminster Fuller on the, on the subject which I think he sort of wrote for, for children or something but um, yeah that was a bit of an inspiration. Anyway so we, we set about um, sort of refining the, the timber from the shed into something that resembled a, a boat. It's, in a way it's a, probably the most simple boat you could possibly build. Um, it's just three planks of wood held together with a series of, of very simple um, ribs. And that's what it looked like um, when it was finished. Um, we were all very proud of it. And the local Weidling club turned up and roasted a, a suckling pig on a spit and drank lots of beer and um, fired a cannon and uh, <laughs> we, we threw the boat into the water. And then the sort of second phase of the project began and we started to um, transport the, the remains of the shed downstream to the museum where the exhibition was happening. Um, so the, the boat became a kind of transport system for the for the structure it had been made out of. <clears throat> and the, one of the, the installers at the, at the museum turned out to be a bit of a, a dab hand with a, a vidling. He'd done it a lot when he was a teenager. 
So he agreed to, to sort of man the, man the boat. And of course, going downstream, it's, it's pretty straightforward because the current just carries you. This is going through the huge, um, there's a, they, they also have a dam on the river which they use to generate power for the city. Um, so you have to go through this lock at a certain point in the, in the trip. And then we, we sort of took the boat apart, and, um, which was quite hard to do, actually. It was, uh, yeah, it had been such a sort of labor of love that, yeah, I couldn't really watch. And, uh, and then we rebuilt the shed again in the museum. Um, so it was a kind of, it, it was a sort of scarred, a scarred version of the structure that we found up, upstream. Um, but essentially, essentially the same thing. The, one of the interesting things was that the, the shed had actually been in many different locations throughout, throughout its life. Um, it had been a, a, a border patrol post at some point and then had been moved and moved again. So there were all these kind of layers of history to the, to the structure already. So we were just kind of adding one more, one more layer to the, to the story of this, this kind of slightly sad looking shed. Um, and also it had been sort of repaired at different times in its life. The, the, the roof and the floor were, were much newer timber than, than the rest of it. And of course you could sort of, particularly from the inside of the shed, you could start to piece the boat together in your, in your mind. Um, and um, look at all the, the marks and cuts that were made to, to, to produce the boat. That's the end. Um, yeah. Thank you. I don't know if anybody has a comment or a question or anything, but Where you. Do the, uh, planks board end up? Sorry. What happened next to those planks? planks board? They're back in the shed. They're, they're they're in the shed. The shed is now in the collection of the museum, actually. So it's yeah, it's going to stay there. So yeah. How did you determine that there was enough wood in the shed to actually construct the boat before you? I mean, there was far more wood than we needed. Oh. Yeah, yeah. We just we probably used a quarter of the timber from from the shed, and the rest was, as I said, transported by boat down downstream. So, yeah. I mean, you can just see by yeah looking at a boat and looking at a shed and realizing that it's going to work. I mean, the problem was that. Quite a lot of the wood was not in such good shape, so quite a lot of it was a little bit rotten and full of bugs and stuff. So um, yeah, we had to be very careful about you know picking the right. Most of the most of the wood for the bottom and the sides of the boat came from the floor and the ceiling of the the shed because they were they're much more recent. I think the the guys who owned it said they're probably from the 60s or something. They they'd replaced the floor and the and the roof, so they were in quite good shape. Um, so we just had to eke out enough of the other timber to make the, the beam, the, the ribs of the boat. We had, we had to add one thing, which was um, some, there's this stuff called corking, which you put in the, in the joins between the boards, which is a cotton kind of rope, which you bang into the, court, um, into the seams. But apart from that and a few screws and things, that was pretty much, and some glue, that was pretty much, yeah, all shed. Yeah. Very reserved. Mm. They appear, and I sh I'm just interested in hearing more about the the process of removing yourself, or whether it's I mean, as you create more and more of these, are you more intrigued by is is the 
performance still just an element of work process, or is it becoming a more pronounced, or, or even the human relationships involved in the pieces, and then they're yeah. presented in a very I guess, or I guess it's something that I'm, I'm sort of, I'm sort of thinking or rethinking all, all the time. Um, but it, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's just not, on, on, a, on a very basic level, it's not in my nature to sort of perform in that way, you know, although I'll do it in this kind of context. It's, it's just, um, I don't know. I mean, I suppose it's, 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 it's a different, it's a, it's about not, I don't, I, in a way, I don't want the work to be about a kind of, it, it, it doesn't want to be too sort of gung-ho and macho and sort of, in, in a way that perhaps, you know, burden can be, or, or it's, it's not about sort of putting yourself through something or, um, of course, there's an element of that, but I, I don't want that to be the, the sort of concern of the work, you know. It's not about dragging my body over broken glass, or you know, it's 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 much more. Um, yeah, I'm. I like to. I don't know. Just distance myself from it. Um, but yeah, it's an on, it's a sort of ongoing. It's an ongoing thing, I suppose, and also how. There's always this. There's there's always this sort of anxiety. Because you're always leaving a lot of stuff out. Um, when you when you make the exhibitions, there's always sort of stuff that gets lost. Perhaps it kind of comes back in in situations like this, or in catalogues, or um, but it, it's 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 a sort of yeah, it's an ongoing discussion within the work, I suppose, and finding ways to to deal with that. Um, but um, yeah, I don't really have I don't really have a good answer to that question. But yeah, it's something I'm thinking about all the time. Um, yeah. Hmm. Ha have you ever been invited to a situation in which you couldn't find a convergence of things to create a work? Mm -hmm. Don't know. I suppose you. Uh, yeah. I mean the. the uh, I guess maybe maybe when I present the works like this, it, I, you know, I, it, it probably seems all a bit sort of seamless and and like I have a very clear strategy or something. But it's really not like that at all. I mean, it, I just um, I think when I make these kind of you know slightly sort of themed sort of readings of the work or whatever, then it it it, it sort of it seems much more like that than it is. And it's the work is in, invariably kind of very varied and and. And the way it's generated is is very varied, but somehow there's a yeah. It, it's sort of you're it's all, you're always sort of bringing your baggage to a particular um, situation, and and that baggage combined with with the sort of the site or the context or whatever tends to, to sort of function in a way. So. So far, I, I don't know. You always sort of find a way to, to, to negotiate it or navigate it. Um, but it's not really, yeah, it's not so sort of systematic or anything, the, the approach. I try and sort of approach each project quite, I don't know, uh, uh, sort of anew, I suppose. But it, yeah. Of course, always, always sort of bringing my, my kind of ideas and concerns and interests with it, and yeah. It sometimes, it sometimes, a, it does sometimes feel like a real pressure, as because I because you, you sort of get a reputation for doing these projects, which sort of appear from from. A kind of engagement with a you know a particular situation, and and you you feel people really want that from you, and it's not always what I want to do. So so it's sort of yeah, I don't know. I think there's a sort of sometimes a little bit of disappointment from people when I say I'm going to do you know, something something completely different, or so I don't know. But yeah, anybody? Yeah. What did you do with the balsa wood? 
I, ah, yeah. I made a, I made a radio controlled airplane with part of it, not much of it. But it was, it was a project, there's a, there's a very beautiful house in the outskirts of Melbourne called um, Heidi, um, which was built by these kind of patrons um, called John and Sunday Reed. And they, they, were, they were sort of trying to create this real sort of bohemian thing in, in, um, in Melbourne um, in the sort of 50s, 60s. And they built a house for themselves with, it's really a kind of international modernist style house um, designed by two Australian architects called Neil Everest and um, David McGlashan. And it's beautiful, beautiful house. And they, they, they planted, um, they, were, they were very keen gardeners and they planted this incredible arboretum with trees from all over the world. Um, but also sort of in a way quite radically at the time, they kept a lot of the indigenous trees that were growing on the land. Often they, people would destroy them. And, and there's this very beautiful tree um, called a red, a red River gum tree, which has this fantastic scar in the bark, which is, um, so the story goes, from uh, an Aboriginal uh, boat builder who cut a piece of the bark to make these little, it's just by a, a, a river, the house. And um, so this was a kind of trigger for, for sort of making this project. So I, 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 um, I went to Ecuador and, and found this tree and then used um, a section of the tree to, to build this small um, radio controlled plane, which was actually just flown once for the opening of the exhibition above the house. Um, and then it was exhibited sort of with the, the remains of the tree in one of the, the rooms overlooking the garden. And um, yeah, it was a, the plane is actually one of the planes that uh, I sort of needed an excuse. So I, I flicked through um, Le Corbusier's um, Towards a New Architecture with this chapter about um, aviation design and found a little picture of a farm and mosquito from the 1920s and I, f I managed to track down some plans for building this so I built a copy of this plane. Yeah. Was there some else? No. Oh, okay. There are different types of returns in your work. For instance, with the shed where it starts as a shed and then it's transformed to the boat and then it returns to the shed. Yeah. And the trace of its, I think you said it's the word scarring. Yeah. Um, and then there are these returns to um, Duchamp or Rancuzzi or Williams. And I was wondering if you think of there being any correspondences between those types of I, I, it's actually, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely idea. It's not something that I sort of, sort of have been so conscious of, but yeah, I suppose there are, there are kind of some maybe connections there. Um, and I suppose, I suppose the, the, I mean, one of the, one of the links is that you're, you're sort of dealing with with objects that you're sort of intervening with or, or um, scarring or remaking or... Um, so, the, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a sort of physical connection there. I mean, whether there's a, a sort of more complex, I don't know, sort of historical thing going on, I don't know really. I haven't sort of, haven't, it's not something I've sort of thought through, but yeah, no, it's a nice... Yeah. In very close proximity to the show. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if yeah. something is produced in that place. I mean, no, I mean, I, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I suppose for the, 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 the show in Basel for me was a really, it was a real sort of experiment. It was the first time that I'd really tried to bring a lot of projects together under one roof and to, 
some projects which were new, but also some projects which um, kind of had other lives and I was trying to sort of work with again um, and sort of build, build some sort of new dialogues between all of these projects. Um, but I was, I was also sort of very conscious of trying to, I'm not really answering your question, but I, I, I was also very conscious of trying to build sort of different kinds of experience into the into the exhibition so some of the you know some of the work um, has has this sort of uh, complexity and and uh, sort of is is, is sort of structured um, in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of I don't know web like way or something and then other works like the cuttings piece is, is very sort of reduced and sort of serves almost as a sort of diagram or a model for for some of the other, um, other more complex pieces, so sort of to try and get in, to try and get uh, sort of very, in a way, very sort of language-based um, works to to sort of talk to these sort of dumb, much dumber pieces in a way, I suppose, and to try and sort of um, sort of see how that see how that worked to sort of create different space different kinds of spaces for people and also to think about think about the 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 context for the exhibition in quite a sort of exploded way the, to 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 work with a very very localized context being the building and then this kind of the context of basel and the river and then this kind of you know the story of the electricity and the, this kind of more sort of um, international or global sort of span for the for the work. So, yeah, trying to sort of make all those things things sort of <coughs> coexist. So, and also I suppose it's always it's always a very when I'm making exhibitions, it's always it, you know I, I I I sort of knew that the quality of the 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 prints that I was making the the, the sort of platinum print they they would sit very nicely with this kind of um, moldy old shed somehow. Um, so it's it, it's on, on a very sort of um, yeah, sort of haptic or something level as well. It's just yeah, it's about stuff too. So yeah, sorry that was a very roundabout sort of approach, but yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I I suppose I I always try and sort of maintain a slight I don't know sort of amb ambiguity in relation to that. I mean, because I for me the of, quite often the the projects sort of exist in in many different forms. I mean, like the 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 flagger piece, the car which I drove to Poland. Um, for me, in a way, the the book is the project. It's somehow the most I don't know the most important thing that was that, that was generated from that. I think, um, but it, it does it does vary. It sort of does vary from. But I, in, I suppose I, I I'm in in one in one sense as I was um, saying just before the the kind of the physical. Um, quality of the work is very, very important to me. It's, it's sort of, it, it has to feel kind of invested in, I suppose, that, that there's, um, that it can be sort of read in that way. You can almost sort of, I don't know, the hope is that you can almost sort of feel the sort of energy that went into making the project in, in the final object. You know, you can read the scars of, of, of the shed somehow. So, it is a very, it's a very, yeah, it's it's a very sort of um, 
I mean, sort of, so, so I suppose, like traditional sculptural sense of things in, in, that, in that way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I like, I like the idea of the, the projects being quite, you know, maybe a talk about a project is, is as much a manifestation of the work as, as, as the book or the object or I don't know. Um, probably shouldn't tell the collectors that, but <laughs> yeah, 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 maybe, yeah. Yeah. Okay. get lost without this added component of, of the talk of the presentation, and unless you, you also do it in some of the documentary um, work, is, is the relationships that are developed in order to, to make these projects happen, the relationships and the, and the conversations, and yeah. the, and I wonder, is this, are these kind of talk presentations, the, the way that those um, relationships are Incorporated into the projects, or are there is there other documentation like your books that yeah. record those? They they do sometimes, yeah, to a certain extent. Um, but no, yeah, it's it's sort of inevitable that a lot of that stuff gets lost to most most people. But um, I mean, it's a yeah, it's such a. I suppose that's why I, that's in a way one one of the reasons that the work has become so formally diverse is that I'm really I really love working with new people all the time with new skills and um, you know going to this funny old shed on the back of a house in in the south of England to make platinum prints with this guy who's sort of um, or you know working with these two artists to build this boat and there's there's it's such a it's such a kind of privilege in a way. And it, yeah, maybe it is a, a frustration that, that some of that stuff gets gets lost. But I think very often it it's sort of those sorts of experiences feed back into the work later on and, and perhaps manifest themselves in, a, in another way. Um, not explicitly, but they're sort of there or thereabouts, I suppose. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a nice job. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's amazing how incredibly generous people are as well. You know, if you can just sort of spark something that that. But it's one one of the things that I've enjoyed is is sort of, in a way, people that that, that I work with often there's a sense that I'm making work about them, to a degree. That I mean, for example, I made a, I made a a work in uh, in Romania. Um, a few years ago, for an exhibition in France, I, it was a, one of the frac spaces in, in Montpellier, and they, they, I discovered that they produce all of their catalogues in Romania, partly because it's cheaper to print things there, um, and partly because of a kind of strange um, personal collect connection with the curator and, uh, and Romania. But um, So I sort of set up this, this project which involved going to Romania to produce a catalogue which was sort of about making itself. It was a sort of closed system around making a book for an exhibition. So I, I went and worked with these printers in, in Romania to, to, I took some photographs on the way to the, the print works and then we used those to generate the first few pages of the book and then I photographed those pages being printed and blah, blah, blah. And there was, there was this very nice, it was a, it was a really nice experience because you could, there were these wonderful moments where you'd be printing a, basically a picture of the print works and you could, they would like, do you think that yellow's the right color? And you could just hold the page up to the wall where the yellow thing was <laughs> and compare the two. So there was, it was a really nice, it was a really nice process. And there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of that, that I suppose, in, in the, way, the way that I sort of formulate these things. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> By something that you seem to be in your work, which is something that seems to start out as sort of an intellectual interest, or I guess 
I, I would have thought this about your work before I heard you speak. That something starts out as sort of an intellectual interest that obviously you do a lot of research, but by the end of the project, it seems like you've layered an incredible amount of tenderness around the object that you first identified. So I'm, yeah. I, I mean, I think with you ending with the, the shed, boat shed, you know, that is so apparent in, in all the processes, but then also the way that you're talking about it. But then once I see that, and then I sort of look back over the other work, I'm just yeah. sort of rethinking you, digging something up and, you know, bringing it someplace. But it almost feels like at the end, I think, I guess what I'm interested in is, is how the object then becomes <coughs> so layered with your tenderness. Um, and I just, I just find that really interesting in this time in, in contemporary art, especially with the fact that if I, especially with the fact that I didn't know that actually, I didn't know this about New York. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I guess I, I guess I just would be interested in, in what you think about that and, um, yeah, I guess I just would be interested in what you think about that. <clears throat> I don't know. I, it's it's such a nice comment. I don't know if I want to reply to it. It's yeah, tenderness. It's a, it's a, the first time everybody's said that about the work, but maybe yeah. It's it's yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, hmm. It, yeah, um, uh, I don't know, my mind's gone blank suddenly. Um, but yeah, no, I, let's just let that ride, I think, that's good. <laughs>